Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I am your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by our fearless leader, Adam Jacoby, and second fearless leader, Ross Binder, here on the pod this afternoon. Uh, lots to talk about with... Uh, coaching stuff with the Iowa football program and of course basketball in season wrestling just wrapping up a meet last night Ben Keeter getting his first college experience on the mat as well but first off the most fresh news that we've got at hand Seth Wallace named assistant head coach at Iowa given a raise of $250,000 to uh, must be must be tough I don't know how he's living on that money up to a million dollars annually Phil Parker also earned a well-deserved raise at $1.9 million. Of course, Kelton Copeland not being brought back. We haven't potted since that happened, but we've got that story up on iowa.rivals.com if you want to check it out. Um, I usually start with Adam. I'll, I'll hit you here first. Uh, thoughts on on just the news that we just got, the, the coaching updates. Seth Wallace named assistant head coach. Phil Parker gets that raise. It is... Well-earned respect for Seth Wallace, uh, a well-earned uh, promotion was the word I was looking for. And you really just look no further than the guys that he's got uh, that he's coaching and what they were able to accomplish just this year alone, because we were looking at a situation where it looked like on paper, Iowa was going to be missing Jack Campbell, Seth Benson, and Justin Jacobs, all from that linebacking court. Remember, Justin Jacobs transferring to Oregon was a bombshell in the portal this time 12 months ago. And linebacker looked like the biggest uh, area of concern for this defense. And you look at what they did this season. Jay Higgins is an All-American. Nick Jackson walked into an impossible situation and ended up with 110 tackles. He is coming back in 2024 and he's going to have a monster year. And you look at guys even like Kyler Fisher, who, you know, worked his way into that rotation, was technically a starter, even though, you know, Sebastian Castor was getting more of those snaps as, you know, the uh, as the year went on. But ultimately, this is a reflection of the value that Wallace brings to the roster, his ability to get these guys ready to be coached by Phil Parker, ready to be coached by Kirk Ferentz and, and, you know, making sure that their system fits. And, you know, the proof is right there. He, he has earned the respect that he's gotten from coach Ferentz and, uh, uh, as, as another uh, beat writer said, this is sort of a reflection of the uh, interest that he's gotten from other programs too, right? Like these raises don't just happen in a vacuum. They're the result of negotiations that happen during the off season, especially at times like this. So uh, it is in and of itself, uh, you know, a, a reflection of how valuable Coach Wallace has been, but also a, a reflection of how valuable other programs think these guys are facts ross your thoughts on on the updates with the coaching staff and the raises and such yeah i mean adam kind of stole my point that i was going to say about uh you know the the fact that the raises and the promotions it's really you know it's about reflecting that they're what they bring to the iowa program of course but also the fact that they're very, very desirable outside of the iowa program there are lots of other teams that would like to have Seth Wallace on their staff or that would like to have, you know, Phil Parker uh, as their defensive coordinator. There's, you know, you go down the list of colleges that want Phil Parker. It's, it's long, I'm sure. So the fact that, you know, Iowa is, and Kirk Ferentz is committed to keeping them. Like he knows they are extremely important parts of uh, obviously the Iowa defense, but the overall Iowa program as a whole. And, um, you know, these are, you know, very deserved based on their performance. I mean, obviously Phil Parker, like I, I don't think there's a number high enough for what he brings to the Iowa football program. Like his, his value as the defensive coordinator is immeasurable. He's just immense. 
Uh, and Seth Wallace has been a, you know, a tremendous addition as a uh, as linebacker coach, assistant, uh, you know, code defensive coordinator. He has some technical assistance there. Uh, and yeah, just that what he brings in recruiting as well. And, um, you know, he's, he's another extremely good coach. So yeah, these, these moves just make a lot of sense and it's about, uh, you know, locking up what you've got and making sure that, uh, you know, you don't get weaker uh, by losing people that are extremely important. Bingo. And in that, <laughs> I, I have to mention one thing that I saw on Twitter this last week and maybe is why they give Phil gave Phil Parker this raise is somebody from a T- Bama Twitter account said Phil Parker may be interested in the defensive coordinator job. <laughs> maybe that's why they gave him the six hundred thousand dollar raise. <laughs> like, come on, how many delusional fan bases think they can land Phil Parker? You know, I asked uh, too many. Um, I, I asked Logan Lee about this after the the Big Ten when. Uh, you know, Gus Johnson was one of the people hopping onto this little, um, you know, bandwagon of, oh, wouldn't it be great if he coached somewhere else? And, you know, what these fans, what these, you know, lazier announcers sort of have to understand is these guys are not just motivated by, you know, obviously everybody wants to win a championship. Everybody's motivated by winning. But Phil Parker, if if Phil Parker really wanted to coach at the school that had the best chance of winning a national championship, you know, he probably would have been gone by now. And the same really goes for Kirk Ferentz, too. He could have chased the glory by now. And the fact that Phil is still around is a reflection of the fact that Kirk is still around, right? It's all the same culture. It's all the same, like, we're building this stability right here with a purpose, And a lot of fans don't get that. A lot of fans want to just sort of wish, you know, cast or, you know, like, oh, what happens if Phil Parker's in Columbus? You want to know what the answer to that is? He's miserable. That's what happens (laughs) if Phil Parker's in Columbus or College Station or Tuscaloosa or Athens. You know, like, he doesn't want to deal with that. If he did, he would have left Iowa City by now, a long time ago. Or to the Gus Johnson point, Los Angeles, Phil Parker in Los Angeles, what? It, it yeah. would be wasted on him. We'll put it that way. <laughs> and two, the dude doesn't even like to come out of his office to go to Florida for recruiting trips. You're telling me he's moving to Tuscaloosa with a new staff, <laughs> guys, a bunch of guys he doesn't know. I, I'm gonna say I doubt it, but. That kind of sums up how I'm I'm feeling about these these promotions and and the raises. Phil Parker more than deserving. I think he's a top five most paid assistant in the country now, um, at at one point nine million dollars annually, which he more than deserves. Art Broyles Award winner, arguably if not literally considered the best, def- or excuse me, assistant coach in the country after winning that award. Secondarily, I'll hit this point and then I'll go to you, Adam. Wallace getting this raise and being named assistant head coach is important, I think, for the future of Iowa football, not necessarily just now. Somebody uh, on Twitter responded to the tweet that I put out about him being assistant coach and said, presumably this means he's going to be head coach when Kirk Ferentz moves on. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that for sure. I don't think anybody truly really knows that. But what it does speak to is his ability to coach potentially, you know, we've kind of assumed that he would take over that defensive coordinator position once Phil Parker moves on. But either way, it not only shows that you see potential for him in the future, but you're rewarding him for what he's already done these last seven years with that linebacking core that has had players like uh, like uh, Jack Campbell, excuse me, had a had a momentary lapse of where I was for a second. Josie Jewell, Jay Higgins, Nick Jackson, Seth Benson, like the, Justin Jacobs at one point in time. The list goes on, right? I mean, Seth Wallace has done a phenomenal job as the linebacking coach. And, you know, as a former wide receiver at Co College, like to come in and and have that difference of position and learn the intricacies of it all and coach it that well is really telling of the type of person and coach that Seth Wallace is. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that the um, 
you know, the, the value sort of reflects the, um, or, you know, the contracts sort of reflect the value to the program. One other thing that has been pointed out is the raise to Phil Parker, one, obviously he has earned it, but two, it also creates a higher, or, or a, I should say a larger window for a salary that Iowa could pay its new offensive coordinator. Right. Bumping Phil up to the high like one million range means that, you know, if there's somebody out there who is asking for 1.6, 1.7, what have you, you know, it, the optics of Iowa paying a new offensive coordinator with no connection to Kirk Ferentz more money than Phil Parker would have been getting would have been tough to justify. It, they, they probably would have made sense. But this, at the very least, allows Iowa's program to say, yeah, Phil is the big dog here, right? Like he, <laughs> and if you're not going to pay a defensive coordinator, you know, like Phil Parker, that kind of money, then when would you ever, right? Like, obviously he's the guy that if you've got the money to do it, you make sure that that money goes to him first. But it also means that, all right, now that he is, sitting on this big old dragon pile of loot, whoever the OC is, you know, you don't have to feel bad one way or the other about paying them 1.5 or 1.6. Like this is an escalation of what that budget is. And ultimately it's probably going to be better for Iowa, but it is also still mid January, no OC. So <laughs> we'll see how much, of a benefit that actually is Ross and any, any sort of read between the lines that you've got on this? Uh, no, I mean, nothing else on, on Phil Parker uh, or, or Seth Wallace. I think, uh, you know, your point about, you know, boosting uh, Phil's salary to kind of give you more wiggle room with the new OC makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, we'll see where they go with that uh, in terms of the other, you know, coaching news from that release. It was just the confirmation really that, uh, Kelton Copeland is not going to be back next year. His contract was not renewed. We had kind of speculated about that on our, was it our last podcast, Elliot? Or I know it was a recent one, I think, where. I think it was our last one. We mentioned yeah. Copeland being, if anybody moves on, it's Copeland. Um, and the potential of it yeah. being George Barnett as well, which. Right. Knows. Yeah. So we, 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 we talked about this before. So I don't think it came as a surprise at all when the the news came out at the end of last week that Copeland was not coming back. Um, you know, you really just, you look at the performance of the receivers under him the last few years. And you, obviously there's a lot more than just the wide receiving coach at play with the, uh, the issues with the Iowa offense, but there was not a lot of uh, successful or satisfactory results to point to uh, either. And the, the transfers out from that group were uh, pretty significant as well. So um, you know, I, I think that that move is not a surprise. You would think I probably that whoever the new receivers coach is will probably have a connection to uh, the new offensive coordinator, probably someone that's, you know, thinking along the same lines. So, yeah, I think we'll find out more about that probably when we find out the uh, offensive coordinator. Um, is that what you're what were you thinking about that, uh, Adam? Oh, I, you know, it's, it's sort of the same boat that you have to be able to look at, you have to be able to point at some sort of success for any sort of position coach. Uh, you know, we were just singing the praises of Seth Wallace, his track record of success with the linebackers is unimpeachable. And you look at the track record of wide receivers under Kelton Copeland, and it's the opposite end of the spectrum. There just wasn't that success that he could have fallen back on in terms of, you know, bringing out the potential of these guys. The, the potential he brought out was the potential to transfer, and most of them ended up doing exactly that. You know, it's, it's grim, but that's where we are. <laughs> and, Sorry. you know, that had, to, that had to change. And one way or the other, whether that's a position coach thing, whether that's a higher up on the ladder sort of thing, something had to change with the Iowa passing game. And, you know, switching the wide receivers coach seems like a start. A good start. A yeah. good start. 
and what we presume to be an opening for Hall Chris to bring in a wide receiver. And yes, I am a wide receivers coach. Yes, I am the master of segues, if you were wondering. And so with that not happening per, uh, I think it was pro football or football scoop. Chad Lysico also reported that Chris is out of the running. Um, and so is Joe Philbin reportedly. Now, I don't even, guys, I genuinely, I, I said this on our board, and it kind of appears this way across the board for um, I, Iowa media. It's that we don't know what the hell is up next for this o, 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 OC offensive coordinator position. At Iowa. I mean, losing out on Christ was pretty massive. I, I don't want to say everybody was on board because we had people on our board actively saying that they did not want Paul Chris to be the next offensive coordinator, to which my response, beggars cannot be choosers. <laughs> and now it's in a situation where it appeared as though Kirk zeroed in on him and money clearly not the issue. Clearly not the issue with Paul Chris not wanting to be the next offensive coordinator at Iowa and for anybody else for that matter. Adam, you said it. Paying the next OC $1.5 million makes a hell of a lot more sense now and become, becomes a lot more feasible. And so whether or not that happens is up in the air. I mean, Brian Ferentz was making eight seventy five, I think. So we'll see what happens in, in terms of the contract and how much the next offensive coordinator will, offensive coordinator will make annually man having trouble talking today but with that said why do you guys think Chris has you know reportedly opted out and decided he does not want to be the next offensive coordinator at Iowa Ross, I'll let you jump on this grenade first. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, the obvious answer, I think, is that he didn't want that he that the handcuffs from Kirk Ferentz were too significant that he uh, you know, he wouldn't be able to run the offense he wanted to he would want to run, and he wasn't interested in a you know a severely limited version of that offense. And if he has aspirations of coaching beyond you know, this role, offensive coordinator at Iowa, you know, and, and not performing well here could, could harm those future aspirations. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, the Chris tire seemed to make a lot of sense on, on paper because it seemed like he and, and Kirk would be uh, more simpatico than just about anybody else, except maybe Philbin, who obviously Kirk has previously worked with. So we know that they're, uh, you know, on the same page or, or can be, um, so yeah, the, the fact that Philbin said no, I think is a pretty, it feels like a potentially big indictment of, of Ferentz in this process. Um, and that if he's not willing to relinquish more control, uh, you know, what, what is Iowa going to end up with here? Um, I, I mean, the alternative is that, Hey, maybe he just really likes living in Austin and that brisket is really good and he doesn't want to mess with, uh, you know, the brisket in Iowa City, but I, it's probably not the brisket. So, um, I don't know. That's my two cents. What do you guys, uh, what, are you, what are you thinking? Ross got the grenade. Adam, you take the flashbang. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you did mention the, you know, what sort of a job like this would mean for Paul Christ's sort of future potential. And some of the rumors that we had heard was, were that, you know, he was sort of looking at this as a next step or a, a step back into head coaching. And, you know, if, if he gets the sense that that door wouldn't have been open for him at Iowa, right, that, that this wasn't a, you know, wink, wink sort of arrangement for him, or if he gets a sense that running the offense the way Kirk Ferentz wants to do it, like you said, Ross, if, if other teams see it and they're like, yeah, this guy doesn't have the juice, that is, you know, really a long-term foolish decision for what would be, you know, a pretty short-term contract. So, yeah, that there is something that 
really sort of has to be examined there. And I was uh, as surprised as you guys because you look at Philbin and you look at Christ. I didn't think that there would be two thanks but no thanks in that mix. I thought there was going to be a sure yes between the two, at least one, if not two. So I'm surprised that Iowa finds itself in this position at this point, you know, mid-January. And it, you know, it's it's really not a, you know, I'm, I'm sure Kirk Ferentz is not panicking, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure that he's still where he wants to be. But even by the timeline that he had been communicating, which all the fans were like, man, that's slow, right? <laughs> Even even by that timeline, this is taking longer. And every single day without that OC is a day that, you know, say potentially somebody in the transfer portal is like, yeah, I can't trust anything that's happening there. Or a player that sort of has to make a decision about his future on this team, a player that's on Iowa's roster. Like, do you, you know... What's the choice you make at that point? So, you know, it, it is something that they need to get shored up sooner rather than later, just administratively, just have it done. <laughs> so the coach can start coaching these guys, you would think. Um, but we're, we're coming up on three coming up on three months now since Brian was it was made clear he would not be back. And it kind of feels like we're back at square one in terms of this this search and this you know this new hire like the the names that have been floated out for a couple months it's like well nah that's not happening so you know now we're back to okay who is it going to be and you know the one thing Ferentz has said before was that there would be a new crop of candidates you know from the NFL when you know they go through their you know purge of of coaches so i mean that's true uh, but you know, is <laughs> is one of those guys going to write in and uh, save the day for Iowa's offense? I I don't know. I mean, we're we're in um, we're in uncharted territory here, unfortunately. So the longer this goes, in you know, I I hate to make this an indictment of the society we're in because that's not my prerogative. The long, but the longer this goes in the instant gratification society that we live in, the more antsy, the more irritated the fan base is going to get. And then if things roll around in September and the offense is terrible again, I don't know how you continue to work with this. I mean, we guys, we're not fans. We're journalists. We're going to be there no matter what. But when you've got a family of four, you typically buy season tickets. Maybe the kids have a soccer games on Saturdays. Like, what are you picking here? Am I picking to go watch Deacon Hill play quarterback again? You know, God forbid Cade gets hurt again. But like, if if that happens and the, or the offense was incompetent with Cade at quarterback, with Luke Lachey healthy, with your bevy of running backs you've got, what kind of decisions are you going to make? I mean, I think last year was an indictment of the fan base in a, in a positive indictment in terms of their their loyalty to this program, their loyalty to Kirk Ferentz. And I mean, yes, the Hawkeyes won 10 games this last season. But at some point, you have to refer to the fact that Iowa football, that college football, that football in general is for the purpose of entertainment. And that's not entertaining football. I mean, like... You know, I'd like to think that I tampered my expectations going into this season. Like, this is going to be bad. It was worse than that. It was putrid. It was horrid. If I had a, 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 a an upset stomach, I'd probably vomit how much I had to watch Iowa football this fall. Well, I don't know how you continue to operate like this. How you, I mean, potentially go into February without an offensive coordinator when Alabama hired their head coach in like 48 hours. Nebraska just hired an offensive or like a, a quarterback's coach, I think. It's like, oh, dang, thought that was supposed to take three months. Oh, dang. <laughs> I guess like 
And during the season, it was, oh, dang, the offense isn't supposed to work. Oh, dang. Got to rely on the punter again. Oh, dang. Jay Higgins better make that tackle. Sebastian Castro better come down with that interception. Otherwise, they're screwed. Oh, dang. Here we are. Three months since Brian Ferentz was, it was determined he wasn't coming back. Oh, dang. Guess we were wrong again. Guess we got to wait. Like, I, I, at, at some point, it comes down to this conversation that I think this is all found like it's it's a foundation of a echo chamber that I think was put together by the Ferences because it's just oh I'm right oh you're my dad oh whatever we know more than everybody else to now I know every more than everybody else I haven't hired an offensive coordinator yet like this is this is silly. I I don't know how many times Adam, you and I, ended up at other you know other games, press boxes elsewhere, talking with other rivals people, and they say, "How do you do this?" One, and two, how does Iowa do this? It's obvious to everybody except for them. Everybody else, the A and F podcast guys at the register, like. I just sat down with the guys, uh, the the AMF guys yesterday here in Minneapolis. You may notice a change of settings for me. I'll stop rambling after this and get to your point, Adam. But I sat down with them, and it's I, I we had this conversation yesterday. It's everybody can see it. Everybody can see these deficiencies that need to be changed, except for those inside Iowa football. And again, we are not fans. Us three, we are not fans. But this is irritating for us. Like, we got to watch this. We got to cover this. And half the time, it's just like, oh, here we are again. Adam, make your point. Sorry. <laughs> no, you know, it's it's interesting. And, and there is definitely a culture of Kirk Ferentz leaning back on the benefit of the doubt. And it's a benefit of the doubt that, by and large, he has earned over this quarter century. Right. At, on some level, and, and he has been quick and, and frequent to remind us, they've won a lot of games. They won 10 games this year, Elliot. I don't know if you heard. And <laughs> Breaking news. Yeah, yeah. And, and Kirk will be the first, second, and third to remind us of that fact. And, you know, on some level, he should, right? This is his job to win games, and he just won 10. And you can't really do that at Iowa on a perennial basis because if you could, it someone would have done it by now. So he has always operated with this benefit of the doubt and has always had some level of institutional like help, all right? A, a little bit of, of security, a little bit of support. And again, like that's a good thing to have. I, you you want that sort of stability and you don't really stick at a university for 25 years without that level of stability. He has enough rope to hang himself as this offensive coordinator stuff goes. Say what you will about Beth Getz, but she has a little bit of a knack. Just keep handing you a little bit of rope if you want it, if you want it, if you want it, if you really want it. And you know, she said that she was going to be hands off in this process. That was a, from the jump, they said that they were going to, you know, all right, Kirk, you do the picking. This is not going to, this is not going to be an AD hire of the OC. This is going to be a football hire. Do your little football hire. And it still hasn't happened yet. Right. He's got this benefit of the doubt that he really, really wanted. And what's he doing with it? So, this is, he's really going to have to stick the landing on this one. Really going to have to stick the landing if he wants to keep falling back on that benefit of the doubt. Again, more often than not, he does. He has earned his way into this position and let's not, you know, imply otherwise. But now he's in this position. And if this slow, methodical, like deliberate process if this is really the best way to do it, then it's going to work out, right? Right? Like, if he's saying that this is the way he wants to do it, okay, here's all that rope you asked for. 
here's all that leeway and benefit of the doubt. Okay, but it better work. And we were in this position 12 months ago, six months ago, what, however many months ago, having the same discussion about Brian. The, all right, you wanted this leeway, you wanted this special little arrangement for him so he could have another year. All right, let's see it. Let's see it. And they didn't even come close. So, all right. They got worse. It it, it got worse, and, and some of that was out of their hands. And, yeah, it did suck that Cade McNamara got injured. Yeah, but the coaches are happy to tell us over and over again, injuries are part of football. So, you know, either it's an excuse or it's not. Either it's next man in or it's not. And we can play little, you know, semantic games with all that during the season like Kirk wants to, evidently, because it seems like every single press conference devolves into semantics. Or, you know, let's see it. Let's see it. Let's see that higher. Let's see that. Let's see what was not working get fixed. Tell us what wasn't working. Show us how you fix it. Should be as simple as that. And, you know, here it is, mid-January, and fans are still waiting. Ross, do you have anything to add before we keep this conversation moving? Uh, No, I I don't think so, but I think – you know, the fact that Philbin turned Kirk down apparently is is even more surprising to me than Christ. Because Christ, I can see from the standpoint of, you know, if I'm trying to use this as a springboard to another position, um, and I don't know that I can do that from Iowa if I'm working under, you know, restrictions, et cetera. But Philbin, to me, you know, he's an analyst. I don't know that he has head coaching aspirations at, at this point in his career anymore like you know he was the Dolphins head coach he's he's done that I don't know if you know he wants to get back into that game at his age so it did seem like you know just being an offensive coordinator might be a you know for a guy that he likes and respects and Ference would be a you know an understandable way to kind of wrap up his his career and he apparently decided yeah thanks but no thanks to that so that to me is almost a bigger like you know, why, why are people not willing to take this job that, um, you know, seems on paper like a really good job? You know, you're going to get paid very well. You're going to be offensive coordinator for a major Big Ten program. You know, there's a lot of upside here on paper. Obviously, the downsides of, uh, you know, the historical incompetence of the Iowa offense, the, you know, Kirk Ferentz, if he meddles too much etc. Like those downsides are winning right now in this, uh, this coaching search and uh, Iowa football is going to be in trouble if they continue to win. There is there, there's an anecdote uh, about when uh, Hayden Fry and Bill Snyder were watching Iowa on film when they were either deciding to come to Iowa city or after they'd been hired, but before the first game, but they're watching I will play. And this was Iowa at its dirt worst, and they were still putting 50,000 in the seats. And, uh, you know, one of the coaches says, you know, gosh, the, um, you know, these guys, they, uh, they're standing up and cheering for every first down. And, uh, and Hayden says, imagine what they'll do for some touchdowns. <laughs> Iowa I'm telling you, a new OC, if you even bring 25 points a game to say 30 and they're building a statue, that's how starved these fans are for points, right? You bring them 25 points a game and you're going to be as secure in that job as even like LeVar or Phil, right? Bring them any offense, any offense, and this is close to that perennial 10 win team that <laughs> Iowa has won, never been, and two fans have been, you know, convinced for close to a decade now that they are that close, that they're just one good offense away from being that perennial 10 win team. All right. Well, like this is this is it. Like, how would a coach not want an opportunity like this? You would think. You would think. If that 
comes to fruition, excuse me, comes to fruition, they may well be clamoring for you to be the next head coach at Iowa. I mean, right Am now, I? right now, a lot of the fan base, if they look at the staff, they think Seth Wallace, they think LeVar Woods. But if you come in and you revolutionize that offense, you turn that offense. And when I say revolutionize, I mean, make it relatively competent. <laughs> then you will be seen as a legend. They will start erecting the statue after the first touch. Like, not literally, because that would have happened this year. Brian Ferentz would have happened. I was going to say, this this (laughs) sounds familiar. (laughs) (laughs) So there's, there's a lot of opportunity, whether it's, it's whether or not these potential candidates want all of the issues that come with it. How much is Kurt going to force, you know, his hands into the offense? How much? Who's to say? What kind of weapons do you have? What kind of offensive line will you have? Even with all these guys returning, how good is the offensive line going to be? Are you going to be able to bring in your guys at these position coach positions? Is Kurt going to force you to keep George Barnett? Is he going to force you to keep whoever else, to keep John Budmeyer maybe? Are you going to be the wide receivers coach? Are you going to be the quarterbacks coach? To me, these are the things that left Paul Christ out of this position, in my opinion. That's not necessarily informed. That's what I just deduce from the situation at hand. Because Paul Christ knows football. If you're bringing in a guy that knows football and telling him, nope, you got to listen to me all the time. I'm going to have my hands in it. Sorry. Okay. All right. Good. Sweet. Now I'll just go back to Austin, Texas. The one last thing that I'll say on Coach Christ. His nephew was on Iowa staff this year. He was there in Iowa City. He was there to be whatever sort of intel Paul Christ needed. And Paul Christ has said, I'm not doing it. Read into that whatever you want. Paul Christ came this far to only come this far. And... I don't know how that's not an indictment on some level of what Kirk Ferentz is offering. Very good point. Yep. And that's that's something that we alluded to uh, during the recruiting process of a certain quarterback. A certain quarterback was being recruited by none other than Keller Christ. We had that information on the premium board during the season and premium subscribers were privy to that at that point in time. If you want to be a premium subscriber, you can head over to iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe because we're getting you as much info like that as we can. And to me, I know you guys read those articles too. To me, that was Chris is their guy. That's what that said to me. And here we are. Now, does Keller Chris stay with the Iowa staff? I presume so. They they probably, I mean, they weren't going to hire him if they didn't see any merit to hiring him. Right. They, sure, there's the Chris connection, but it's not like, here, now help us bring in your uncle. That wasn't it. <laughs> now, with with all of that said, I, I know there was, there was conversation about, is it Brennan Marion from UNLV? That conversation was going around. But as things move forward, which... That conversation was going around. I don't think there's much to that. Ross, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, no. That would I just know. seem like a really ludicrous, like Twitter fever dream that, like, you know, popped up for a couple hours and it's like, oh, this guy's an offensive coordinator and oh, we need an offensive coordinator. And it's like, he is the antithesis of everything Kirk Ferentz wants offensive football to be, um, you know, which means it would be, you know, super fun for him to be the offensive coordinator, obviously. But is it just it made no sense to happen with Kirk Ferentz as Iowa's head coach? Like, it made negative sense if that's possible, which it, it's not. But it was just a, a really ludicrous, um, like I said, just thing something that popped on Twitter and whatever. It's like pe- people are just getting stir crazy because again, we're approaching three months now without a new offensive coordinator, and especially now we have no idea where this search is going because the top two candidates have apparently said. Thanks, but no thanks. So it's like we're all in the dark here. We're all just grasping at straws and getting a little uh, 
a little feverish. Now, you said it yourself, grasping at straws. Where did they go from here? Does Kirk still have Ken O'Keefe's phone number? <laughs> You're like, what? what's, what's next, man? Where do they go? I'm sure Ken's, Ken's still on speed dial, I'm sure. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody from the NFL, but I don't know who the obvious or even less obvious hire from, you know, some staff that's, you know, they got dismissed at the end of the season. I mean, the the crazy, crazy name would be like, you know, uh, Bill O'Brien, because he was, well, he was at Alabama with Saban, wasn't he? He wasn't even in NFL technically, but. Tommy yeah. Reese? Uh, you, you, yeah. you know who's got some some free time on his hands all of a sudden? A couple guys. Bill Belichick and Nick Bill... Saban. <laughs> Pete Carroll, too. D- and Pete Carroll. I, and Pete Carroll coached at Iowa State. He knows the area. Look, oh. like tanned, rested, and ready, baby. Let's see it. <laughs> Pete Carroll to Iowa City. Uh, I, I think he was on Johnny Majors' staff at ISU way, yeah. way back. I mean, away. I'm. I'm sure the the beach at the Coralville Res compares to like the beaches in Southern California, right? I mean, favorably, yes. Basically, this basically the same thing, I think. Especially this time of year. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> now, all, all jokes aside, by the way, somebody posted on the uh, iowa.rivals.com free board and said Bill Belichick is Iowa's next OC, and they meant it. So. I've I've taken a few shots at the free board and that that being one of them. Now, if you want to be car, be part of a, a legit conversations, you can join the premium board at iowa.rifles.com. We'd love to have you. Now, to continue the conversation, like right now we're throwing darts at a dartboard that's 200 yards away. That's essentially what we're doing. We're grasping at straws. We're finding a needle in a haystack. That's what we're trying to do. It's it's become educated information that people had, that people talked about to speculation, which is not where Iowa fans, you should want us to be right now. I'll tell you that. That is not where you want us to be. You start looking at the NFL, the Saints just laid off, or laid off, just fired a bunch of uh, position coaches and their head, their their offensive coordinator, Pete Carmichael. We talked about Bobby Ingram as bringing in uh, the being the next wide receivers coach uh, with with Paul Christ. He's still looking for a job. He's out at Washington, no longer with the Commanders. He was their OC in in Christ's final year at Wisconsin. Do with that what you will. But he does have OC experience. I think just the one year. Also, previously a wide receivers coach, he can come in and be the OC slash wide receivers coach, and John Budmeyer can be promoted to quarterbacks coach. That's really the only thing that I think of immediately where there's some sort of quasi connection to Iowa that was momentarily there with Paul Christ. And like, then you start looking at those names like Bill O'Brien and Tommy Reese, which are still way out there. They're not quite Bill Belichick out there, but they're still way out there. I, I don't know, like to me, Philbin and Christ were the options where you look at them coming in as an offensive coordinator and being able to push back a little bit on Kirk Ferentz because they have his respect. Now, what this looks like to me is Kirk going out and getting a yes man, of which he already had, and we saw the fruits of that these last few seasons. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know where else this goes. I'll just point out that... You could make a case for Joe Moorhead, the who's currently the head coach at Akron. And again, like we're throwing darts at this point, right? We have to. <laughs> and, and and there's some some darts being thrown in Iowa City too. But you look at a guy like Joe Moorhead, who is still only quote only 50 years old, but has those connections from, you know, Allegheny, from Fordham, you know, from the from that Northeast, like Ken O'Keefe circle, uh, you know, has coached, um, you know, uh, Penn State and, um, you know, has that Big Ten connection, has that Pennsylvania connection, right? 
and was the coach of the uh, QB that Iowa had dalliances with for about three days uh, before Thompson. he committed to Tulane, Ty Thompson. Yeah. Like Which, he had, again, he had, we were the first ones in on that to say that he was not visiting. So, yeah. Yeah. How about that? Shameless plug for a third time on today's pod. Go ahead, Adam. So he's a guy who, at the very least, seems like he might check a few boxes. Like right now, he's just slumming it at Akron. His record is 420. So in case he wants to zip it up and zip it out there, um, you know, I presumably being Kirk Ferentz's OC is better than being the Akron head coach and, and winning two games a year. I, 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 I'm pretty confident in saying that, especially if I was clearing out room for a, you know, a pretty decent seven figure um, price tag for its OC. So, you know, it's another place that he can look. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's another thing where it's just like, Maybe this, maybe that. Like we're we're just sort of finding names and being like, how does this look? And that's not how most OC searches go. We'll put it that way. So I, I'm sure fans are clamoring to get some sort of resolution on this, whatever it is. For mental health purposes, we may need to move on. <laughs> Ross, Ross, do you have anything else to add before we start talking basketball? Let's talk hoops. All right. So in Minneapolis yesterday, Iowa takes the W. They've looked the best they have looked in a long time. Iowa men's basketball. Fran becomes the all-time winningest coach in Iowa history. Gets emotional after the game talking about Dr. Tom Davis. I've got a recap, three takeaways uh, on iowa.rivals.com. You can check that one out there, um, edited by Ross Binder himself. And now to talk about that victory, to talk about the last few games, I'll say it again. This is peak. This is what Iowa needs to be. This is what Fran wants this team to be. Now, do I see that translating into a win against number two team in the country, Purdue? On Saturday, not necessarily, but the rest of the schedule is favorable. And going 0 and 3 to 3 and 3 is the trajectory you want to be on as a Big Ten basketball team. This is starting to look like a tournament, an NCAA tournament team, when at the beginning of the season, they did not look so. The one thing that really stuck out to me, uh, two things that really stuck out to me, which again, you can read into more on iowa.rivals.com from me, our uh, men's basketball beat writer for the site, is the response to being down 14 to three, 10 to one early in the game, because that happened against Iowa state. Now Iowa state's a better basketball team than, than Minnesota. I think we can all agree on that. Bold, but, bold territory here. <laughs> sorry going. guys. Hot take of the day. Just call me Stephen A. Smith. Now yeah. with the way they've improved and the thing that stuck, stuck out to me the most and has stuck out to me over these last few games is that response. Because a month ago, that would have been it. All she wrote in the first two, three minutes. Iowa loses that game. What do they do? They hunker down. They get back to who they are. They get out in transition. They start making some threes. Josh Dix, in particular, finishes with 21 points. Ben Cricky leads the team in scoring with 23. Does exactly what you brought him in for. No, he doesn't need to be a defensive stalwart, but you get him a, a paint touch and he's going to score. And he's got that midi to his game as well. Tony Perkins getting four layups in a row as Minnesota starts to maybe look like they could claw back in those final few minutes. Your older guys do what they need to do. The younger guys do what they need to do. Save Owen Freeman getting fouled out on several bad calls, in my opinion. But he was impactful. 12 points, eight rebounds. Laji Dembele played some quality minutes, though it didn't necessarily show up in the stat sheet. But Josh Dix goes out there. Has another career high, second game in a row with a career high. Josh Dix becoming the player that he was brought in to be as well. Uh, you know, in addition to what Ben Cricky was able to do yesterday, he be, he's, he became that knockdown shooter that you want him to be. He's the best defender on the team, and I, I tweeted it out because he is the prototypical player that I would use in two K and just like annihilate all my friends and piss them off. Like Josh Dix, what you know, like Anthony Morrow back in the day, Thunder. Small forward. That's a name drop for you. I crushed with Anthony Morrow back in the day. Now, but 
Josh Dix relative. What? I'm trying to remember where he went to school. Is it Cincinnati or was it a I Big Ten team? Don't know. I have no Sorry. Idea. I'm, I'm just remembering some guys at this point. Yeah, it's okay. Continue. <laughs> Continue. Josh Dix created his own shot off the dribble. He came off screens. This team is so much more active offensively than they were for the first two, three months of the season. So much more active. There's no more ball watching. There's no more standing and watching Peyton Sanford try to chuck up a shot. Sanford will still chuck up some shots because that's part of his game. He's a heat check kind of shooter. But this team has quickly evolved into what they needed to be to be able to compete in the Big Ten this year. I think that the way they're playing right now lends itself to them being an NCAA tournament team. Ross, you're you're along with me on on the beat. Uh, you edit all my stuff for for the men, and, and you watch all the games. Likewise with the women, and you're on our wrestling beat. So you're all over this winter helping us out and 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 doing your job at a high level. Now, and tell me what your thoughts are on on the game from from yesterday because you are right along for the ride. Yeah, no, I mean I, I'd have to totally agree with what you're saying. I think that was a a really good performance by them. And you're right. That's not something we would have seen from them like a month ago. You know, we, we saw them get in those holes a month ago and it just went from bad to worse, essentially. Like there was no, no stopping the bleeding. There was no climbing out of the hole. It was just, well, I guess this is what it is today and it's bad. And that's all you could do is just kind of endure it for two hours, basically. And uh, yesterday I thought, um, you know, Ben Cricky, I thought at the start of that game was huge. Uh, he was great, you know, throughout pretty much the whole game, but he was the guy that really kind of stopped the bleeding. It felt like he got a couple buckets, you know, and they were down and then, you know, got them on the board to start chipping away at that 10, one, that 14, uh, three deficit. And, you know, that's, I think that that's, you know, that's one of those things that this is why they brought Ben Cricky in. Right. I mean, he's, an experienced veteran player. He's a scorer. Um, you know, you like you said, you're not bringing him in for his defense. You're bringing him in for his offense. And he provided that in a big way yesterday uh, when they needed it. And that was, you know, just really great to see. Uh, and then Josh Dix, like you said, like he has blown up the last two games, uh, looked phenomenal. His threes are falling. The defense is there. Uh, he's getting stuff going off the dribble. Um, yeah. I mean, you really love to see what's happening with Dix. And, you know, I think it's getting to the point where even when Patrick McCaffrey's ankle is healthy, do you want to mess with the starting lineup and, and put Dix back on the bench? I don't think I would do that because um, the way this lineup has looked with Dix in there has been really strong the last few games. And I, I would not want to mess with that uh, chemistry. And, you know, to plug one of our, our own uh, pieces on the site, uh, we had a piece yesterday, a premium post, looking into some of the stats about uh, which combinations are working really well for Iowa and uh, who's got some of the best uh, points per possession results. And Josh Dix uh, was up there, especially with uh, Tony Perkins. Like, that's a pairing that Iowa hasn't used a ton, but we've seen it have success. Uh, we saw it be successful again yesterday. Like, I think that's something that Fran and Iowa need to lean into uh, right now and uh, see where that can take them. Because I think that that backcourt has some real potential. And uh, we, we've seen you know, with those guys producing, uh, with Peyton Sanford producing, Ben Cricky producing, Owen Freeman continuing his march through uh, the Big Ten. You know, was, he's he's going to be the freshman of the year. He's got to be. It's oh, yeah. It's going to be an injustice if he's not. Um, like, you know, I'm not quite willing to go where you are in terms of them being in a tournament team yet, but I can see that trajectory for them because they are getting better. They are winning games that they would have lost a month ago. And the big 10 is not that scary outside of Purdue and Wisconsin. And we've already, I was already played them. I already lost to them. Uh, they got one more game with Purdue. I don't think they play Wisconsin again this season. May, might be wrong about that. Um, but so there's a lot of a lot of Big Ten games left against teams that, you know, are going to be more winnable, or games that they're going to have a chance in. So if they continue this trajectory they're on, then, yeah, I think when March comes around, Iowa will be in that, that bubble conversation or that tournament conversation, which 
that did not look like a, a feasible thing for this team at the end of November or the start of December when they were just, you know, taking body blows and just not being competitive in several games. They yeah, did they play were... Wisconsin February 17th at home. Okay. Revenge. <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll need that too because Ross, you, you talk about the um uh tournament hopes for this team and you know the wins just aren't there at this point. Those those marquee like you know, you try to find the best team that I was beaten this year. It might be Nebraska, it might be Seton Hall, right? Like at, at some point the wins just sort of have to show up. So I mean, if anything, that game against Wisconsin in Carver Hawkeye is going to be I don't want to call it a must win, you know, when you're playing a team that good. Uh, but it is a, it would be an extremely helpful win for this team. If they, if they really do have March aspirations, because again, I, they really didn't look like a tournament team for the first 10 games of the season. Didn't look close. Didn't look close. And yeah, the team looks like they're a little bit unstuck the more that Josh Dix plays. And you look at their three-game winning streak. Dix started two of them. Over that three-game stretch, he's averaging, and I'm you know going to round here with a three-game schedule, but he's averaging 15 points, three rebounds, four assists, and two steals a game. Shooting 50% on two-pointers, 67 percent two-thirds on three-pointers and 89 percent from the free throw line like that seems that seems sustainable <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. tell you what if if he shoots you know two-thirds of his threes for the rest of the season i was going to be in great shape you know that part is probably not going to happen but the fact that he's able to be this level of efficient on offense um, you know, one turnover a game is sustainable, right? Um, you know, five steals in three games, he might be able to keep that up. It's close. Like, that is not otherworldly if he's going to get those minutes. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a guy who's got a pretty great steal percentage, um, pretty great, uh, you know, assist rate. So, like, he's able to be this productive when he gets the minutes. So it's not like, you know, I was sort of backing into something and, you know, trying to create the whole plane out of black box here. Like Josh Dix should be productive. So, and he should be this kind of productive too. So yeah, absolutely. This is a positive development for the team and is starting to like reshape where we're looking at them in terms of like postseason goals. Because again, that the NCAA tournament was a like Jim Mora like playoffs like, <laughs> like you better you better worry about like winning any games in the Big Ten first and and now like Iowa has started to win those games in the Big Ten and again you're right you look at what this team's schedule looks like for the rest of the year there are wins there. There are wins and, you know, it's going to be tough and Iowa needs to outperform where it has so far, but on Ken Palm, they're already projecting right now as an 18 win team. Does that get them in the tournament? Probably not. Probably not with this OC schedule that they've got, but that's, it's that's close. Very, yeah. That's a very bubblicious resume. It feels like, but yeah. Yeah. At the very least, that's like two wins away from really making a lot of tournament noise as opposed to being, you know, 10 wins away, which is felt like a little bit of a, a rational fear for this team. So at the very least, and, and I think what really speaks to the resiliency of Fran as a coach, and, and it's not an accident that he just set the Iowa record for most wins and I think that's because you never see a Fran team take the entire year off. They, some of them, you know, there have been some inconsistent seasons. There have been some great seasons too, but you never see a Fran team start bad and stay bad. There's always going to be that resiliency. There's always going to be like, all right, we are going to find some things that work and we're going to just hit those buttons until they wear out. And we're starting to see that a little bit with this team. Do they continue to amp that trajectory back up? 
is this a dead cat bounce for lack of a better term? You know, we'll see. We'll find out. This is three games out of a long season. But there's something there. And typically there is every year with France teams. Elliot, like, do you, do you think these green shoots are real? Um, I do. Now, what it comes down to is the quality wins that you guys have hit on. They've got to get at least one. They could steal one over Wisconsin. Then you become a little less bubblicious, as Ross previously said. You somehow steal one over Purdue this weekend, which I am not predicting. But if you somehow steal one over Purdue this weekend, then we can start really talking. Now, like, whether I, I, I will say I'm not going to predict a win over Purdue, but Purdue on the road has been a different animal. And I mean, they lost to Nebraska. They lost to Northwestern. Uh, I mean, Northwestern's pretty good. Nebraska's had some these good wins. Um, but you know, if Iowa, if things click, and especially if the if the threes are falling for Iowa in that game, then they could they could have a chance. Um, again, I'm not not saying it's likely. Not going to say I'm going to predict. Oh yeah, I was definitely going to be Purdue on Saturday. I'm not not going to go that far. But I can see the world where that happens, and it's not. It doesn't require me to be uh, drunk for that to be <laughs> a thing. <laughs> Now, I think a big factor on in that is if Hawkeye fans show up to Carver on Saturday. Oh, yeah. They haven't done that this season for the men. If there is a time to do that, it's Saturday against the number two team in the country. Zach Eady coming to town. Like, that's the time that you should – pop you know hopefully if you're you're a fan hopefully if you're a member of the team you should see a contingent of the fans show up and influence that game and that's you know young teams are when that really 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 matters and this is a young team you got brock harding owen freeman logic and bailey and and price hasn't been playing consistent minutes these last few games but you got josh dix you got desante bowen you got you got young guys on the court and if you can have that power of of a fan base behind you and that gets loud then that's going to be really beneficial for them on saturday against the boilermakers and and we know these fans are capable of that one we've seen it from the men's team and two i mean travel was not recommended in in johnson county uh yesterday and iowa still put fourteen thousand fans in carver for that game against indiana like we know these fans can show up. We know they can be loud. We know they can make, um, I almost called it Kinnick. We know they can make Kinnick intimidating. Yeah, we know they can make Carver intimidating too. So absolutely right. And, and I think it's an especially salient point that this is a young team. This is a team that is going to feed off of that energy and probably has at some point feed it off or fed off that lack of energy in Carver at times. Like that is... Right. Like if you want to get the positive out of that, we sort of have to talk about, well, what happens when 5,000 fans show up on a random, you know, weekday? Because again, like 14,000 will show up for the women. We know Iowa fans can at some point, you know, help these kids out, you know, give them that energy because they're still young enough. This team is still young enough to be dangerous. This team like hasn't figured out that they're not supposed to win certain games, like the Purdue game. So you show up, you give them a loud environment, as loud as you are for the women. And it, it how funny is it that we're like saying this? Like, be as loud for the men as you are for women's basketball. <laughs> but the it's times they are a changing. Clearly. And but you know, we're it's a situation where I was program could really really use that jolt of energy in this big time game hard to argue now with that said adam tell us about women's hoops you said you got a few things you want to share with us as uh they take on wisconsin tonight yep they are they're going to be playing wisconsin at carver hawkeye arena it's going to be the um second game of the um 
season slate they had won in Madison. And and that was one of the first like, oh, this Caitlin effect is really going to follow them to every single game this year, isn't it? And like it has and it continues to do that. Uh, but yeah, it is, uh, you know, this isn't, this hasn't been Wisconsin's best year, just health wise. So they did give Iowa quite a, um, quite a little bit of drama in Madison, especially early on in that game. That one was close for about the first half. Wisconsin's now down to one and five in the big 10, still dealing with depth issues. And, you know, I was going to be favored heavily in this one. I'm, I'm not going to look up the line, but I'm not that kind of sicko. <laughs> oh, I can tell you, I saw it on Twitter. Her okay. Mike Palas uh, from, from the Gazette. He said that it's 33 and a half. Whoa. Yeah. So that's yeah. about the game that Iowa fans should be looking forward to tonight. And and it's you know, it's too bad for Wisconsin that you know they're they're probably just gonna be a statistic. Uh but you know, at the very least, what we're also seeing from this team this year is they are earning that national respect. You know, last year felt like a lot like catching lightning in a battle. This year. They're in that spotlight and staying there. And it's because they're a better team this year than they were last year, even though they don't have Monica Zanata, even though they don't have McKenna Warner. This is a better team. And a big part of it is, Ross, you've, you've made this point before. It's one thing when Caitlin's playing great. When the rest of the team is hitting shots, they're unstoppable. And we're starting to see Iowa hit that stride and i mean gosh indiana just came to town iowa needed a caitlin clark miracle to beat them last year indiana's a little bit down this year but only a little bit they were still ranked number 14 coming into the season iowa beat them by 27 points on uh saturday by 27 points this is a better team this is you know this is a team that is built for a long March run. And yeah, Caitlin is playing well, but Anna Stulke has taken a massive step forward in terms of confidence and in terms of being put in situations that might be difficult, like playing with two fouls. She's still playing confident, still playing fearless, but not reckless. Like she has taken a significant step forward as a post player. Kate Martin's playing the best basketball of her career in She's got a gear now that I didn't know that she had, but she is turning into that sort of like, I mean, let's just say it like a Scotty Pippen type of player that probably doesn't get enough credit for her athleticism or her scoring ability, but that's only because she's such a leader, because she's such a hustler, because she's such a defender. And having a player like that next to a player like Caitlin, next to other players who just find themselves in the right spot over and over and over again, which comes down to coaching, obviously. Like, this looks like a Final Four team again. This this does not look like a team that needs help to get back to the Final Four this year. Right? Like, Iowa had a favorable path in the tournament. They didn't need it last year either, but they had one. I don't think they need a favorable favorable path this year at all. Um, guys, from what you've seen, what's been exciting to you and, and surprising about the season so far to you guys? Molly Davis. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all yeah, I have to say. I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think the uh, the rise of Molly D has been huge for uh, Iowa Hoops. Um, you know, giving them that second backcourt option is, is huge, but I, I would just say the entire supporting cast really, um, the way they've developed, especially over the last month or so, like that's what really makes this team, like you said, a, a legit final four contender is because it's not Caitlin Clark and, you know, the, the seven dwarves or the, the sidekicks or whatever, yeah. you know, it's, she's got <laughs> legit, yeah, they're not, they're not dwarves. They're not tiny. Um, but like, it's not just her and a whole bunch of like randos. It's like, she has legit good teammates who are playing really good ball. And when they play like that, 
that Iowa is just really scary. Like if you're an opponent, uh, not scary if you're an Iowa fan for sure. Um, because they just get going on these runs and it's, it's like a, a flood coming at you. Like they're just really hard to stop and slow down. And uh, the points just keep coming and, and teams just can't keep their head above water. So I think their ability to do that uh, consistently uh, really makes them a really, really good team this season. If the, um, if the Gabby Marshall transition threes are back and they're back to stay, Oh, this team is extremely difficult to prepare for. Like that, that had been Gabby Marshall being on that slump. And it's sort of been the Big Ten's best help. Not like, oh, you know, it might stay. It, like, just just bring that slump up to Minneapolis. And and now that they have turned that back around, which you knew they were going to, right? Gabby's too good. And and you know, so much of this team is experienced for this they know how to weather tough stretches they know like there's there there have been starting lineups where caitlin clark who let's remember is one of the all-time great has already had one of the all-time great college basketball careers full stop there's been lineups where she was the youngest starter on iowa's team as caitlin clark like as the like program leader in points like we're not talking about three years ago like this team is built for veteran moments and they really needed to be lsu exposed a whole lot about them that only a national championship stage was going to expose about them they're built for it in a way that they weren't built for it before so i'm very excited to see how that one ends up well you pointed out that that iu game last year like last year to win that game i would needed caitlin clark to go off for like i don't know what she had like 40 points i think in that game and of course she had this you know insane buzzer beater you know to win the game at the end and that's the only way you know the win was going to happen this they don't need her to do that they don't need her to score 40 points and you know pull out you know superman heroics to win games they she can get what she's going to do get her 30 and 10 um and then uh, the rest of the team is also going to contribute and produce mm-hmm. at a level where, you know, they can win those games without Caitlin having, you know, superhero moments. Yeah. All right. We'll wrap her up here. We appreciate you tuning into this episode of Hotcast, brought to you by Iowa.Rivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough at Elliot Clough on Twitter. If you're not a premium subscriber yet, make sure you do that today. Iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the little bell so you get notifications when we post a podcast. Also hit that like button and drop a comment. Tell us what you're thinking about who uh, the, uh, oh, you're letting them know, aren't you, Ross? I was like, did I do Ooh. something wrong? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Give us comments. Give us right. likes. <laughs> yes. Let us let, let us know uh, who you think the next OC is going to be in Iowa City. Drop a comment and let us know. And now, don't forget to su- subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this podcast as well. And drop a rate and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps us out a lot. And it does, indeed, make us very happy. I'm Elliot Clough. He's Adam Jacoby. He's Ross Binder. For now, we see you next time.